Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Bible Study on the book of Revelation. Tonight we start by discussing why we are interested in studying the book. We get an overview of the different genres of literature found in the Bible. We look at some ways to interpret Revelation. And we end tonight with a brief overview on the different approaches to the study of the end times. Let's listen in. Let's get started. We'll um, open with prayer as we do every week. Do we have any prayer requests tonight? Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening together. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word, this book of Revelation. And we come to you tonight, Lord, confessing that this is a hard book for us to read. Uh, It's confusing. uh, It's overwhelming to us. And so we pray, uh, we beg you, Lord, to give us your Holy Spirit, to have mercy on us so that we understand what we go through here, uh, that we study this uh, properly and faithfully, uh, that you would guide us according to your word. Uh, and that you would lead us in faithful understanding so that our faith would be increased and our hope uh, would be secured as we await the second coming of your Son, Jesus. Uh, have mercy on us tonight and guide us according to your word and your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All, right. All right. So here's what I want to do. Um, we are not going to do any of the book of Revelation tonight. Uh, so all of that waiting. Uh, what we're going to do is introductory matters, and, and you'll, you'll understand why once we get into it. Um, but this book is, is pretty overwhelming. There's a lot going on here. If you did your summer reading, <laughs> you understand that this kind of literature is not easily accessible. Um, it, it's very difficult, very symbolic, a lot of things going on. So there's a lot of rules we're going to want to follow as we study the text, okay? And so tonight what I'm want, going to want to do is kind of present rules for, for how to read a book like Revelation. Uh, you don't just sort of sit down and say something like, all right, Lord, what do you say to me today? I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds to fly directly overhead. Come gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of the kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. Thank you, God. <laughs> you know, like that's not how you read this one, all right? There's a lot going on here. Why are, why are birds eating the flesh of kings? It's don't worry, that's Revelation 19. We won't get there until next year. Uh, but these are, yeah, there's, a, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of work to be done. So we want to go in well equipped. All right, so that's going to be our goal tonight is sort of prepping ourselves for this thing. A lot of what we'll cover tonight, you kind of already know, especially if, if you've been in Bible study before or if you've been in Crossways before. Some of this stuff will sound a little overwhelming, but it's stuff we've been doing for quite a while already. So, so don't be too intimidated by it tonight. My goal here tonight is not to intimidate you, um, but it is to sort of wake us up to the reality that this is a heavy <coughs> book and it's not a simple read. It's not, as, it's not a matter of sitting down and just kind of figuring it out. There's a lot of work we have to do to get into it. Okay, So that's what we're going to prep with tonight. i am give you a little background of my interaction with this book. In teaching all the other books in the New Testament, uh, prep time for me was not that hard. Uh, I know, so we're going to go through Ephesians. I know Ephesians. I've read it. It's, it's pretty straightforward. The theology in there is Pauline theology. I'm a Lutheran guy. I do all, all I do is Pauline theology. I've ignored everything else, right? So, I mean, <laughs> if we come to a class and I've had a very busy Tuesday... I can kind of wing it. And you can generally tell because I let the rabbit trails go a little further than they should. Uh, But, I mean, I know where to pull back. I kind of know how Paul's going to argue. I know where it's going to go. When it comes to Revelation, I haven't got a clue, okay? Uh, For for when I was in college, late 90s, early 2000s, I I went to a Christian college, theological college, and I worked in a Christian bookstore. What do you think was the very popular book in the late 90s, early 2000s in the Christian bookstore? Left Left Behind Books, okay? Why would they be popular at that point in the history? Because they're going to the new, you know, the millennium. Yeah, two, year 2000, right? Here comes the millennium. Make sure you have a bunch of tin cans full of uh, beans downstairs because of Y2K. And make sure you have all the bottled water in the world because uh, none of your computers are going to work. And society is going to fall apart as we know it. And who knows, Jesus might come back that night too and rapture out all the Christians and it will be nothing but suffering for everyone else. Uh, and so there was a lot of debate and discussion going on when I was in college. And I became fascinated by this topic. 
I became fascinated with this, this topic of the millennium and this topic of the rapture and the end times. And so I studied about it a good deal, a lot in college as well. I, I married a woman whose uh, father is a, a, a raging dispensationalist. Not raging. He's not raging about anything. He's a wonderful, godly man. A raging what? Disp- oh, we'll talk about it. Don't you worry. I'm going to use a lot of words tonight that we will cover. So if I say a big word and I don't get to it later, call me on it. But dispensationalists, people who believe in the rapture and the millennium and all these kinds of things, left behind kind of stuff. Uh, and so, I mean, we even had a one evening, I don't think I'm going too far. One evening he said, we should have a sit-down discussion about what the Bible says about the end times. And my dad said, this is going to be such a waste of time. I'm like, no, dad, it's important. We have to go. So him and my dad and our DCE's husband and, and Steve, uh, we sat down and we argued for like two hours and got nowhere. And my dad was right. It was a complete waste of time. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but anyhow, these are the kinds of discussions that he and I uh, used to have. Um, and, and so this was a big thing for me. And so I would study uh, parts of Matthew, Thessalonians, and portions of Revelation, specifically chapters 19, 20, and 21. But everything else around that, no. I, didn't, I hardly touched it. So I didn't understand it. Why are dragons chasing women giving birth and then those women are sprouting wings to fly away? Why are snakes spitting frogs everywhere? What is happening in this book? It's madness. So uh, I kind of backed away. Plus I got into seminary and then I learned the only thing you should ever talk about is baptism. So this kind of became a backseat kind of thing for me. Um, and I didn't enjoy it quite as much then. Since then, I, I've not really studied this stuff very well as much as I should. Uh, Revelation is a foreign book to me. I, I'm not familiar with it, and I've avoided teaching it on purpose for eight years uh, because it's the way our Bible studies go. I didn't mean to look directly at you, Joyce. Uh, I was looking for hoping for agreement, really, yeah. with that look. The way our Bible studies go, we get pretty bogged down in a lot of conversations, which is fine. It's good stuff. I'm not saying anything negative. But Revelation is like opening Pandora's box of crazy rabbit trails. Where is this going to take us? So I've avoided it on purpose. But now I have to teach it because we've done crossways for 59 lessons, which took us roughly three years. And now we've come to Revelation and we've done every other book of the Bible. We can't avoid it. Um, And so it's going to be good. I'm actually more excited right now about this class than I have been for a while because I'm going to be learning stuff. This is going to be uh, good stuff for me to to revisit and to learn. I never took a class on Revelation. Um, Every time it was offered, I had to take something else. In college, I I could have taken a class on Revelation, but I wanted to go to seminary. And I had all of my Bible study classes out of the way. And they had one other requirement that I had to take. And it was an intro to philosophy course. Are you kidding me? So I had to take philosophy instead of revelation. That was, oh, it was miserable. Philosophy is miserable. Um, but nonetheless, I couldn't take it. Then in seminary, I had something else, so I couldn't take it. But I did take a class called Millennialism and Prophecy. And we'll talk about some of this stuff tonight. In fact, the majority of what we go through tonight will be from my Millennialism and Prophecy class. Uh, with Dr. Reed Lessing, who's a phenomenal professor. So um, that's kind of my engagement with this book. It's not very good. So it's going to be a fun time for us because we're all going to kind of be learning. So, yeah. Good. Why are a lot of people afraid of the book of Revelation? Did you read any of it? Yes. That's why. Uh, <laughs> what am I doing here? Okay, because, because it's, it's a scary book. There's scary stuff in it. I mean... Look, that verse I just read to you about, about birds feasting on the flesh of the wicked kings, that's, a, that's an intimidating stuff. And the imagery is far more violent and bleak. And God can be downright terrifying in this book. And so there's a lot of scary stuff in it. So that's, that's legitimate. I mean, people should be scared of it. I don't know that a lot of Christians are scared of it. Not sufficiently. <laughs> not Christians really, really push that book away. Yeah, and, and a lot of Christians do too, um, and we'll talk about some of that tonight as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of a, an interesting discussion. Luther was not a fan, incidentally. Luther said it shouldn't be in the Bible. Um, yeah, I'll read you that quote here in a few minutes. But I was just thinking that for a second. Luther's it's so intimidating revelation. Intimidating and... and yeah, it kind of like pushes you away from the Bible. It's cryptic. It's in there, nobody wants to read it. But no one knows what it says. Um, yeah, and so it becomes sort of, well, what do we do with this? Luther's line, I don't know if he exactly said this, but it's attributed to him, is that if it's called Revelation, it ought to reveal something. You know, and He didn't say those words necessarily exactly, but he's got 
other lines, um, which we'll look at those here in a little bit. Uh, but let me turn the question to you guys tonight before we get into our discussion. Do you want to study the book? Sure. Yes. yes, everybody does. <coughs> Why? Because I don't want to teach it, so you can say no. I'm not going to be upset with the answer. <laughs> uh, it's confusing, and maybe I'll understand it a little bit more yeah. when the class is over. Clarity, good. Why else you want to read it? It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible, right? Good. You should probably know it then. It's God's <laughs> word, right? Yeah. A lot of people talk about the end times, and, mm -hmm. and what does this really say? Yeah, good. Is anyone here expecting to get a, a, a timetable? for how this thing ends up. Good, we won't do that. 8 o'clock. <laughs> Actually, Keith, I'm sorry, it's 8.30. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes later. If we, if we keep up with this morning's class, it'll be later than that. We got done with class and people started asking questions <laughs> this morning. But isn't All right. that timetable a large portion of the common either misunderstanding or... Um, Point that people want to get out of the book of Revolution, a uh, revelation. I want to know when the end times are going to occur, yeah. and, and they're so obsessed with that, yeah. and that they can see numbers in there that John had no idea yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah, John didn't put them in. There's a line here uh, from G.K. Chesterton. <clears throat> if you guys ever read Chesterton? He's kind of interesting. Read. Hold on. Uh, he he wrote early 20th century in England. Um, he wrote Father Brown. Didn't you? Yeah, Father yeah. Brown Knit Mysteries. Every that's right. Sunday we watch yeah, he's great. So uh, he wrote a lot of uh, Christian stuff too. Well, Father Brown, if he's he actually has a lot of very yeah. similar things. But he says this in his book Orthodoxy: Though Saint John the Evangelist saw many strange monsters in his vision, he saw no creature so wild as one of his own commentators. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good line. Uh, that guy can turn a phrase like nobody's business. But that's that's kind of true. Everyone, this morning, uh, Susan Godfrey said, wow. it's a book like everybody knows, or nobody knows what it means. And I said, yes, and the trouble is nobody knows what it means, but everybody knows what it means. Yeah. Everybody's got an interpretation. Everyone's got an understanding. And since it's so cryptic, it's sort of hard to keep in bounds with, uh, what's going on here. Yeah. Why else do you want to study it? No geopolitical motivations? You don't want to understand what's happening in Israel right now? Anything like that? Don't laugh. That's legitimate. I mean, people, that's what people want to know. Yeah. But that's a lot of the modern interpretations will sure. try to connect stuff that's happening in the world right. to specific comments that John makes. Correct. And we'll get into that later. Uh, right now I'm just trying to figure out why. But yeah, yeah. and we'll, we'll get into all that kind of stuff here in a little bit. Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I have a different reason for wanting to study it. Yeah. It has, it has to do with whether you can actually juice the gospel out of this book. Because <laughs> I sure couldn't. All right. Good. You and Luther are on, on, on a team there, okay? Uh, yeah. You're more Luther than you thought. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Rob Phillips said this morning, I, I said, what do you guys think? The, and we'll ask you this now. I said, what do you think the book's about? And Rob Phillips said, completely seriously said, I think it's about... Uh, the law of God condemning sinners and the mercy of God giving hope. I said, so law and gospel? He said, yeah. I said, you're, you're absolutely right and we made you a Lutheran and you didn't even know it. <laughs> he goes, yeah. so anyways. Uh, but yeah, well, what, is, what do you think it's about? When you think of Revelation, what do you think the book's about? What are the, what are the impressions you get when you come to this book? And finally, what are you expecting from this class? So, so, Do you ever read... Or watch that Bible, the Bible. I haven't yet, no, no. It no. ends with John on the island. Island of Patmos, okay. Yeah. And the impression is he lost his mind. He, yeah. He was completely, you know, bonkers. Interesting. And that's when he wrote Revelation. That's when he wrote Revelation. Okay, <laughs> good. I saw the little case where he was. We'll talk about this next week when we do introductory matters, but uh, it is suggested by some of my professors that this is the first book John wrote. So he was. He got more lucid as he went, because then John is the last book he wrote. Um, and first, second, and third John are in the middle. Kind of interesting. What idea. were the uh, criteria for including a book in the Bible? Okay, I, I do want to visit. We'll do this okay. next week, but I, I will just give you real briefly. Uh, apostolic authority. Okay. Did an apostle write it? Did someone who saw the resurrected Christ write it? 
Yeah. Um, did uh, does it preach Christ? Is it is it oh, keep? Is does it keep David? with the, um, the 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 Latin phrases, the regular fide, the rule of the faith? In other words, is it within Orthodox teaching or outside of it? So is it is it teaching Christ crucified and risen for sinners, or is it teaching? Uh, about St. Peter sprouting wings and breathing fire on people like other apocalyptic literature does. Um, if it's not, if it does, hmm, all right. Is it in line with what the Old Testament teaches? Is it, is it giving you the same message that the prophets gave you? In Revelation, you can't avoid it. In fact, and we'll talk about this later, I keep saying that, um, but it, is, it uses the Old Testament more than any other book in the Bible, except in the Old Testament where they're just talking. But Well, then you have to assume that way back when, and they were discussing whether or not to include it, they must have understood it. Uh, in fact, I, I, I can't remember where I read this, but the fathers, the earliest church fathers, reference it regularly. Really? But later on, it gets out, kind of out of the loop, yeah. because it gets, it's loopy, you know, it, it's, it's hard to follow. And so by the time you get to sort of the quote-unquote official canonization, um, which up to that point, these are the books that were being used already, uh, there's debate. Should this one be in or not? And now, I don't want to get into this, but it's, it's worth pointing out real quick. There's two categories of books that get into the New Testament. I think they're called prolegomena and antilegomena. That might not be the right for it, Latin. Uh, the primary books, no, books we know are in. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Absolutely. Paul's letters, of course. No doubt. First Peter, of course. First John, Yes. These books, there was no discussion, no debate. Some books were uh, anti-legomena. That's not the right word. I think they were called anti-legomena, but I'll revisit this because we'll talk about it again next week, where there was more discussion about them. Hebrews, remember we talked about this. There's no author's name on it. No one knows who wrote it. So it's right. It adds up with the rest of Scripture, but there's no proof that it's an an apostolic author. Uh, James, really low on gospel, right? Uh, also, James isn't technically an apostle, though he saw the resurrected Lord and happened to grow up with him. He's not one of the, the twelve. So there's discussion there. Jude. All right, Jude. Second Peter. It's written in a very strange way compared to First Peter. There's a lot of discussion about it. And then, of course, Revelation, because it's simply so obscure, is it just going to confuse matters? You get to the era of the Reformation, and both Luther and Calvin say... We're not sure what to do with this. Calvin writes a commentary on almost every book of the Bible, but not Revelation. Luther says, and we'll, we'll, I'll just read it now so we can just skip it next, later. But here's what Luther says in, in, about it. For me, it's reason enough for not esteeming it highly that in it Christ is neither taught nor recognized, which is above all an apostle's business. The apostle's job is to talk about Jesus. As, he, as Jesus says in Acts 1, you shall be my witnesses. Therefore, I stay with the books that proffer Christ to me clearly and purely. I just say what I feel. I have more than one reason for declining to consider this book, either apostolic or prophetic. First and foremost, the apostles do not occupy themselves with visions, but prophecy with clear, crisp words, as Peter, Paul, and Christ in the Gospels also do. For it befits the apostolic office to speak clearly without image and without visions of Christ in his work. Then he says later on, in chapter 1, it says, They are to be blessed who keep what is written in this book. And yet no one knows what that is, <laughs> to say nothing of being able to keep it. So that amounts to the same thing as not having at all what is in the book. Um, thus Luther, 1522. Now, incidentally, and I think this is kind of an interesting tidbit, later on in his career, after he'd been through hardship and difficulty and trial constantly for the next 20 years of his life, he had much more positive things to say about the book. And in fact, kind of retracted and said, no, no, this is a very important book. Uh, but initially, in 1522, and you cannot understand why, right? Because if you have a cryptic book that no one can understand, who's going to have to interpret it for you? The church. And that's just not what we want in 1522. We want the perspicuity, the clarity of Scripture, right? Um, and, and so, uh, there you go. Now, so... I, I forgot your initial question. The point is, uh, this is not always the clear... Oh, so there is debate. And the debate continues all the way through the 16th century. And it wasn't just Luther and Calvin, but I mean, Catholic scholars, Roman Catholic scholars for years were debating, what do we do with this thing? So, uh, now, it, what's interesting for us now 
is we have the history and the resources to understand first century stuff that really opened this book up. And that's what's going to be very useful for us when we go through this class. Uh, the language and imagery that is used is not as obscure if you're living in the first century and if you have first century resources that explain it. So, for example, John will refer to the seven hills. Well, in the world, seven hills? Uh, all right, I don't know what seven hills for. Well, that was a nickname of Rome, the, the nation of seven hills. Oh, suddenly now we have an idea of what's going on here. He's talking about Rome um, and that kind of stuff. So, so now we have a little more access to it. Uh, the, big, the big reason it's in here, if you ask me, is that John wrote it. It's written by the Apostle, the Beloved. Mm -hmm. He wrote it, so we keep it. Just because we don't get it, doesn't mean we don't need it. And so we have to learn to submit ourselves to it and learn from it and all that. He says they wrote, he wrote it to seven churches of Asia. Correct. What, what were those? Uh, we'll talk about that in two weeks uh, when we get into the book. But yeah, this is, and we'll talk about it actually in a little bit, but it's really important. This letter, the letters in the New Testament were not written like a big book that just went around. Yeah. yeah, so Paul writes the book of Colossians, okay? And he sends it to the church in Colossa, which I'm sure I'm saying wrong. And at the end of that book, he says, now send this letter to Laodicea and make sure you get their letter too. So what happens is they write these letters and then they send them out so that people can read them. And I imagine what's going on is they're, they're writing them down and then passing them on to the next one and then holding on to them and all that kind of stuff. So, so the seven churches get this letter. Though I'm sure more churches got it and whatnot. Sheldon. Did you say that John, this wasn't the last book that he wrote? I think it's the first book he wrote. Well, I'm no expert on this, but many people think it's the first one he wrote. Yeah. And so of those books, they were all written on that island Patmos? Maybe. He was already banished there. Yeah, some people think that after he was on Patmos, he went back to... Oh, boy, I'm going to get this wrong. I, I think some people believe he went back to Ephesus where he was before and actually ends up dying there. I think that's right. Oh, so he still... He banished, he escaped, basically. Escaped or got off or whatever. I mean... It's not very far. It's okay, not, and that would He learned to swim. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Books get out on Patmos. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm sure he has visitors or something oh, like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not far. <laughs> the dragon from Revelation came and picked it up and flew it over. <laughs> What's that, Art? Is it the same John that wrote John? Yes, we believe this is John who wrote Revelation, John, and first, second, and third John. And what's very one guy says, and this what this commentary says, and I think this is fascinating. We don't need to spend too much time on this. I keep saying these things. Um, <laughs> that if you read it this way, it's very beneficial. Remember how Luke wrote Luke and Acts, Volume One, Volume Two. He suggests you should read John as volume one and Revelation as volume two. So here's Jesus and his earthly ministry. Now he ascends into heaven. What's happening on church on the earth now? And that's what Revelation is. Now it's, it's written very different than the book of Acts. It's not just straight history, but it's an apocalyptic interpretation of what's going on until Christ comes again. Very interesting. And when you start doing that, you'll start to notice parallels between the two. Language becomes similar, and revelation starts to make more sense. Go ahead. So is it going to be your position that, that um, the imagery mm -hmm. in Revelations um, is imagery which was familiar to people in the first century? Mm -hmm. Yes. And consequently made sense to them? Yes. And, and so it wasn't as far off as, as, we, as we read it today? Correct. Yes. I'm, I'm saying that, okay, think of it like this. If I, if I were to take a political cartoon and go 2,000 years into the future, and in that cartoon, an elephant and a donkey are arm wrestling, those people are going to say, why in the world are an elephant and a donkey arm wrestling, right? But you see it and you say, look, Republicans and Democrats, right? It's politics, right? Uh, that's the kind of thing you have going on here, uh, political stuff. So, so language that's used of the beast, and similar language you'll find used of Caesar's you know, in history, um, stuff like that. So some of it will be accessible to us. Some of it won't. Uh, reading this book requires humility. We, we don't like humility. We want to be experts on everything. We know all the right answers. Sometimes we're just going to have to throw up our hands on this one and say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why snakes spit out frogs. Who knows? You know, um, but okay. Uh, all right. So get, real quick, three minutes. What do you guys hope to get out of this class? What are you, what are you hoping from this thing? 
besides just understanding the book better, anything else? Jesus. Jesus. That's the goal. Because as it turns out, Luther and Tom are wrong. Uh, Jesus is all over the book. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Well, I'll just read. <laughs> Jeez, uh, 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 there's a lot of barter we're going to have to do here. Um, but, but the whole thing's about Christ, actually. Uh, he's, he's, the book is saturated in Christ, an imagery of Jesus. And but it's so the final on. story in, in the Bible about Christ. Yes, yes, and it points to the end. So, yeah. So, but it's all about Jesus. Yeah. Anything else you hope to get? Do you happen to know who put all these? books in order. Yep, and I don't want to talk about it tonight because I <laughs> really got a lot to cover. I know that was a rude answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, technically, no? technically, no. I don't know because these books were put together by the churches after they were written by the apostles and right. they sent them around and they just come to the churches and, and in 300 something they finally say these are the official ones and there you have it. All right. All right. Revelation was said to be written in 95 AD. That's the, uh, that's the, is that the best latest theory. book? The Revelation is the latest book? I, unless it was for the first one John wrote. Oh, I see. That's, that's based on the theory that it's the first one John wrote. I'm curious why they put it in the back of the Bible. Oh, be, well, I think Art's point is great. It's in the back of the Bible because it's kind of the consummation. It summarizes everything, and this is the end. The doors, right? This is the end, my friend. Okay. All right. Um, Good. All right, so let's, let's talk about it. Uh, why study the book? i got a few reasons why I think we should study the book. I want to go through them tonight, and we've covered some of this already. Uh, one, it's in the Bible. So we believe, teach, and confess that it is God's word. God has something to say to us in it. And in fact, it does say there in verse uh, 1, 3, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. Uh, for the time is near. Uh, Christ has gifts to give through the book, just as he does through the whole New Testament. So we're going to read it. Uh, it's written for the bride who awaits her bridegroom. Remember Jesus tells these parables about uh, bridesmaids waiting for the coming of the bridegroom. In those days, you didn't stand up front waiting for the bride. It was kind of the other way around. Uh, the, the bride would be ready, the bridesmaids would be ready, at least in Jesus' parables. Uh, and then the bridegroom would come, and they would wait for his arrival. We are in the time of waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom. The church is the bride, and as she waits, it gets really hard. It gets tumultuous and tribu full of tribulation and trial. And so this is a letter written to the churches, to the bride, saying, Wait, be patient, he's coming. All right, be ready now. Um, so it's for us as the church to read it. Um, as we'll say later, it's a book written by an insider for the insiders. We'll talk about that. Uh, we have to read it because there's a lot of bad interpretations. <laughs> in fact, here's what we're going to do. It's going to be fun, I think. And I do this in love. But I'm going to get a little flag. And if you have an interpretation that I think is out of bounds, we're going to blow the whistle and throw the flag. And, uh, and it's all in love. Uh, and, uh, and someone said to me, and, and Frosty Godfrey asked if we could have an instant replay, and I think we can. You and I need to work on that. Um, but, there's, but there's a lot of confusion about the book, a lot of bad interpretations, and so inevitably at some point someone's going to say, yeah, but could it, couldn't this be talking about Russia? Boom! No, it can't. can't be talking about Russia. It's not talking about Russia, and we'll talk about why. See? It's talking about good and evil. Yeah, and we'll get there. Um, but there's interpretations that we'll say are out of bounds. And it'll be worth talking about, but with some fun, okay? And you're allowed to throw the flag at me, just I'm gonna hold on to it, so you can just do it. Um, is it weighted? What does that mean? <laughs> someone asked me the same thing this morning. Is there beans, you know, is it gonna be like a bean bag? So it hits you in the eye. Um, well, Mark, there's... In the book of Revelations in, in um, uh, 11, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Yes. The beginning and the end. Yes. Uh, if this is not right the end, where are we going? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're coming on the end. I think uh, a yeah. big bell would be more. Important. Someone said <laughs> you guys are weird. Someone said that this morning too. <laughs> it's like a, a bell. Call on the table and get that flag. I want to throw a flag. I want to throw a flag. Um, <laughs> I'm going to put a string on it so I can pull. It. <laughs> uh, here's what happens though, and this is going to start happening a lot because uh, we mentioned Left Behind already. Very popular book. It comes from a certain interpretation of the Bible. 
Uh, and it was very popular for a while, and it will soon be popular again, thus around the beginning of October, uh, because it's coming out again, hot dog. And they were thinking, oh, we've got to get an actor who's better uh, than Kirk Cameron. Because, uh, you know, Left Behind came out and the Growing Pains guy was, was the main actor and all that. Uh, but they couldn't find one, so they got Nicolas Cage. <laughs> uh, and so Nicolas Cage, who's a pretty A-list actor, is going to be starring in Left Behind. Which are two things I don't like. Left Behind and Nicolas Cage, so I don't think I'm going to see it. Um, You're casting aspersions now on that. Yes. He's, trust me. Tr- trust me on this. He's not poor. All right. Um, he's not poor. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I am because I don't think he's a good actor. Um, so, so a lot of bad interpretations are going to once again be coming to the forefront, and we have this going on while the Middle East is in turmoil. And when, and I know the Middle East is always in turmoil. But when things kind of flare up like they are right now, people crack this book open and start looking for answers because they think there's some interpretive key to help them figure out why it's happening there and how long it's going to go on and all this kind of business. So we have to be prepared for that. We have to be able to discern. And this is a great reason to put Jude in front of Revelation because Jude reminds us of the importance of knowing true and faithful doctrine. And a lot of bad doctrine comes up and does a lot of damage to a lot of people. Now, the question was asked this morning before I knock Left Behind anymore, but don't you think people came to Christ by reading Left Behind? Maybe so, because even God sometimes spoke through a donkey, you know? I mean, suddenly God will use what he will. Uh, and maybe people did come to Christ through Left Behind, and that's fine. But once they did, we must draw them away from the bad teaching in there and start giving them the hope of Christ. Do you see that? And she said, because look, it, it scares the snot, that's her words, not mine, it scares the snot out of people and drives them to Jesus. But scaring the snot out of people isn't exactly preaching the gospel. And so it's not giving Christ, it's turning Christianity into a safety net as opposed to the hope of everlasting life, something like this. So there's, there's some tricks. You've got to be careful with that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, so we want to be loving... Uh, but figure out what the book actually is teaching, okay? And how it fits into scripture and all that kind of stuff. Uh, another reason, it's nuts. It's just a crazy book. It's hard to figure out, and so we have to do work, and we have to do it together. The most dangerous way to read Revelation is by yourself, saying, I'm just going to figure it out on my own. Because you're probably not. We need to have some humility with this one. So we read it together as a congregation, but also with the church. The entire church has been reading this book for 2,000 years, and so I imagine someone has something fruitful to say about it. So what are we going to learn from others? Because we're not just going to come to the right interpretation by ourselves. Okay. Um, and finally, because we studied everything else in Crossway, so we have to. All right. All right. There are a few things. Any questions up to this point? Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about styles of literature, styles that this book is written in. Okay. And and this is important. Remember, not all scripture is read in the same way. Remember talking about this when it comes to like Matthew? You're reading a story, a narrative of Christ's ministry. Then you get to to Romans. Romans is a theological discourse. It's a dissertation, basically, of what the theology is. It's almost, you know, even like it's a letter versus a story. Old Testament, you have prophecy, which is to be read different. Like in Isaiah, you don't read Isaiah in the same way you're going to read, say, Chronicles. Which is Chronicles is just straight history. Here's what happened. Isaiah is prophecy. Here's what you need to know from God. Here's what this pastor's preaching, and here's what's going to happen in the future. So it's going to be read a little bit differently. There's, uh, there's three genres of literature that we see taking place in the book of Revelation. Three genres. So when we go to this book, this sort of thing needs to be in the back of your head. The first genre we have here is, it is an epistle. What is an epistle? A letter. We have an epistle reading every Sunday, right? The very first part of the book, Art brought this up already, is written to the seven churches in a epistolatory format. Epistolatory, I don't believe is a word, but you know what I mean. Uh, it's written in such a way that uh, Jesus says, all right, John, here's what these seven churches need to hear. Jesus, who is very familiar with his churches because he walks in the midst of them, which is a phenomenal phrase, says, hey, Laodicea, 
here's how things are going. I'm ready to spit you out of my mouth. <laughs> we should talk about that. It's time to repent, and if you endure persecution, here's what you're going to get. Basically, the format you'll get in each of these epistles is, here's the good, here's the bad, here's the ugly that could come, here's the hope. All right, and we'll see that through those seven letters, and we'll spend plenty of time in all of that kind of stuff. Very similar to a letter Paul writes. Yeah, I mean, Paul says, hey, Galatians, here's your issues. Repent and believe. That's kind of a theme there. So that kind of idea is going on. It's written as a letter to churches. However, it's not exactly like Paul's letters, is it? Uh, suddenly, other things start happening. It's also written as prophecy. Tell me what is prophecy? Explain prophecy to me. What does prophecy do? Predicting future uh, spoken by a priest. Future, so a, a priest predicting the future. A priest predicting okay. the future. Okay, that's a half right answer. It's okay. both predicting the future, but also preaching to the present. So what does the church need to hear now? So think of Isaiah, for example. Isaiah will say, look, a virgin is going to give birth to a baby. Is that a future prophecy? Yeah, he's talking about Christ hundreds of years later. And then right after he gives that future prophecy, he says, and so, King, whoever, Ahaz, or whoever he's talking to, uh, so, King, here's what you need to know now. So it foretells, but it also, uh, in the phrase is forth tells. Tells you what you need to know now. So, this is very important. Because John is not just going to be saying, here's what's going to happen in the last seven years of the world. Here's the signs. Get your checklist out and we'll figure it out. He's speaking to specific situations at the present time in his context. Okay? So, when he talks about dragons and he talks about women giving birth to children and sprouting wings and flying to the desert and things like this, he's talking about stuff that is both present tense, happening already, but also, then, what's going to go on in the future? So what's going to happen in the future? Why does it matter now? That kind of stuff. So it's prophetic. Make sense? No. Yes? Why is it prophecy and not fact if an angel was sent to John there is, and, and stated this stuff factually to him? I'm not sure. What, why are you drawing a difference? Sheldon, why are you saying there's a difference between prophecy and fact? What do you mean prophecy by that? Prophecy is a prediction. Yes. It's a sure and certain prediction. It's a factual prediction. Oh, so Isaiah says a virgin will give birth to a child. That's not something he sort of wouldn't be as interesting if this happened. It's not a, it's, it's not a psychic looking into a crystal ball. <laughs> Just say metal ball because that would be hard. Um, but it's, it's, it's actually God saying, here's what I'm going to do later on. So you can count it as done. So for example... When God baptized you, he saved you, and he said your salvation is as good as done. It's prophetic. Baptism is a prophetic instance in which God says, in the future, you're saved because I did it right now. That kind of thing. It's sure and certain. Yeah. When, when we used to argue um, with the LDS people, yeah. um, one of the things was prophecy, because they have a lot of prophecy. Sure. And, and the point was that the prophecy never came true. So it wasn't really prophecy at all. Yes, correct. You know, it was a babble. Yeah. In order to be prophecy, it had to actually come true. Moses, exactly right. Moses says um, something to the effect of when prophets arise among you, test them. If what they say happens, they're good prophets. If not, they're bad prophets. And you can do a, a pretty intensive study of the Old Testament, deciphering good from bad. The ones who make it in, make it in because what they said came true, right? So. Yeah, Keith, did you... Well, I was following up on Sheldon's question. Yeah. What I thought he was asking about is when he reported that an angel told him that information. Uh -huh. That's not prophecy. That's a, a historical record. Yes. Happening, right? And it's an angel, yeah, actually coming to him and talking to him and then giving him the prophecy. So that doesn't fit under apostle, epistle or prophecy. Though. No, it will fit under our next category. Nice, <laughs> nice job. Uh, well, we got just, we got six, apocalyptic. Six, Whoa, look at this. I've been spelling it all day. <laughs> you know what happens? If you write in really sloppy fashion, it doesn't matter if you spell it correctly. A P O C A L. Good heavens. Y P T I C. Apocalyptic. Apocalyptic literature. We need to spend a little bit of time on this. When I say apocalypse or apocalyptic, what do you think of? 
end times, in what kind of images come to your mind? Flowers, no. rainbows, and unicorns? Scary. 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 Unicorns with blood on their horns, right? Yeah. <laughs> Scary. Fire, right? This kind of uh, demons, wars, rumors of wars. Jesus is kind of um, um, all of that discourse, wars, rumors of wars. Hide in the hills with your babies, this kind of stuff, yeah? Apocalyptic is just the Greek word for revelation. And really quick. Revelation. Everyone say together. Revelation. There's no S on the end. All right? Revelation. We're not reading the book of Revelations. The book of Revelation. You may get a flag. I'm just saying. You know, revelation. All right. All right. Um, but apocalyptic literature is, is not a literature that's just simply talking about the end times, but that's an aspect of it. Apocalyptic literature is literature that reveals something from God. Which is funny because remember Luther's line? Uh, if it's called Revelation, it ought to reveal something. I mean, the funny thing is about apocalyptic literature, it's revealing something, but in really cryptic, obscure ways, using a lot of symbolism. And so there's going to require a lot of decoding when you come to apocalyptic literature. Let me give you a few key characteristics. Uh, one, it describes the end of the world. End of the world events are going on there. So Joyce, A plus on that one, all right? Second, the message is delivered from God through an intermediary. That is, an angel. Keith, you get the A there. Or some other divine being. Okay? If you did your reading of Ezekiel, or, or especially Zechariah here, and, and Daniel, angels come to them and take them on kind of a tour of what's going on. Zechariah, I think, is the best example of it, if I can recall where the angel is saying, here's what's happening now, here's what's happening now. Uh, other apocalyptic literature outside of the New Testament, but very popular in John's day, books like Enoch, um, I think one's called uh, Esdras, I, mean, I could be wrong on that. There's other apocalyptic literature. This is a common form of literature in, in this day. There's angelic beings that come and kind of reveal to you what's going on in heaven while other things are taking place on earth. And then the angels do a lot of interpreting for you. Now, one of the things you'll notice in Revelation, the Revelation to John, is that the angels don't do a lot of interpreting. There's some points where they do. What does this mean? Well, you know, all right. Um, but it's not going to be happening all the time. Something worth thinking about, okay? Um, but isn't, isn't coming from supernatural being like angels inevitable? Because a prophet said that. I just thought of this. Yeah, yeah. Well, it wouldn't be credible. There's always sort of this um, there's this great debate about Elijah goes up on the mountain and the word of the Lord came to him. Well, how? What, what does that mean? And it's, there's not really a great clear answer. Some people say um, angels kind of revealed it. Others say, I mean, you read the prophets, it just kind of sounds like they really know what the Bible says. Uh, they're very familiar. So uh, they're familiar with what Leviticus says. If Israel does this, then these things will happen. And so the prophet will say, well, we're doing this, so here's what's going to happen. Um, and God has somehow revealed to them that it's going to happen soon. The prophets, I can't remember all this stuff now. This was a long time ago. But they would go into the temple, and sometimes they would have visions. Think of Isaiah. Uh, he goes into the temple, and uh, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and then the angel comes down and touches his mouth with a coal, if you remember that story. Isaiah got his vision, and that's where he got the word. Um, but other times, God's revealing to it, and you're not really quite clear as to how that works. There's not a great exact science to it. Now, apocalyptic is different, because apocalyptic is saying, I'm going to take you up and show you from heaven's perspective what's happening on earth. And, so there's, and I'm going to do it with very, in very symbolic ways. So there's a difference between that kind of revealing and what you have, say, in... Um, Hosea, or, or let's just say in Isaiah with the oracles against the nations where Isaiah says, thus says the Lord, Nineveh, your toast, something like this. Does that make sense? There's a long answer with a lot of caffeine in it. Um, oh, there's another, there's another way of saying it. I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not always sure how the prophets get their, their words. But the apocalyptic ones come from an angel on some level. Okay. But the one thing that's clear from Scripture is that it's not 
their message. It's God's message. It's always God's it's from God. They're not just making it. Uh, throughout, you know, pick any of them. Yeah. Whether it's Isaiah or any of the other prophets, and you see that constant phrase. Thus, thus saith the Lord. Lord. Right. Uh, the other one, the, the good example is Jeremiah. Remember, Jeremiah is walking around. And he's got a yoke on his back, and he's saying, "We're toast. We're going off into slavery." And another prophet, whatever his name was, in this case, we now comes and breaks the yoke and says, no, God told me we're going to be home in like three weeks or something like this. And Jeremiah says, boy, I hope your God's right. But the one I talked to said something very different. Yeah. Sometimes they would use, I mean, we're almost, that's almost the, the umim and the thumim, the, they would almost like gamble. Remember at the beginning of Acts, they're, they're picking who's going to be the new apostle and they, they kind of roll the dice. Say, oh, the Lord says you. They would do that. And they would reach in a bag and say, Lord, what's going to happen? All right, looks like we're going to go. And sometimes angels would appear, all kinds of amazing things. All right. Like I said, I don't know. Uh, a couple other things. Um, the visions and dreams occur regularly. So sometimes the words come through a dream. You remember Daniel. Daniel will have dreams and he'll wake up and he won't eat for days because it will just bother him so badly. So there's dreams that are taking place um, very often in this kind of literature. Uh, supernatural intervention rescues the sinful world in a way beyond human ideologies or schemes. Uh, this is a fancy way of saying, look, God's going to save the world and none of our plans are going to do it. Capitalism won't save the world. Environmentalism won't save the world. All right? Fascism won't save the world. Monarchies won't save the world. Only Christ will. That's kind of the idea there. All right? Next. Uh, worldly events, past, present, and future, are depicted with elaborate and bizarre symbolism. So decoding is going to be necessary, and we'll talk about how we can decode here in a little bit. And finally, Art, you get the A on this one. Good and evil are always battling in apocalyptic literature, but good always wins. I, I don't know of any apocalyptic literature, I don't know much apocalyptic literature, but where the devil comes out on top, which doesn't happen, okay? Um, whether it's in the Bible or not. Now, this is just sort of extra credit here, some distinctions about the book of Revelation from other apocalyptic literature. Uh, it's not pseudo, there's no pseudonym. It's a pseudonym for an author. What does that mean? Okay. You put someone else's name on it, right? So Enoch, who's Enoch? Who knows who Enoch is? Here's your five, five points for this one. He's in the Old Testament, Enoch. Walk the way, we sing a hymn, walk the way that Enoch trod. It's way back in the early Genesis. Early Genesis. And he did not die. Enoch never died, right? He got to go straight to heaven. Uh, however that works, because he walked with God. Um, and then about, you know, uh, 2,000 years later, he wrote a book. Probably not, right? So there's the book of Enoch. It's apocalyptic. It's credited to Enoch, but obviously he didn't write it. You know, he, you know he's, not, he's somewhere else. He's busy. He doesn't write anymore. Um, and so, so it's not really Enoch. But they use his name because there's a certain message and certain following they're trying to get. There's nothing sinful about that. Everyone knew it. They weren't lying. Like, guess what? I found Enoch in the desert. That's not what they were doing. Um, so they would use someone else's name. There's, there's the Apocalypse of Peter, I think, is one. Um, all these other ones. This one, however is credited to John, and it is believed that John actually wrote it because we have a guy named Polycarp who, uh, let me make sure I get my names right here. Polycarp was John's disciple, follower of John, and then his next guy, who, who I forget, said Polycarp credits this one to John. In other words, when John was teaching him, he was reading the book of Revelation to him. So, so the idea there is that John did write this one. It's not pseudonymous. It's not speculative. There are no specific calculations of the end. He's not giving us a checklist of signs to look for. Okay? A lot of the apocalyptic literature will say, before the Messiah arrives, check these things off the list. Once they're done, he's here. Even Daniel kind of gets at this stuff, right, with his numbers, 70 weeks and 69 weeks and one half week of the 69th, 70th or something like this. Uh, there's, there's literal sort of date setting almost taking place there. Revelation doesn't do that because Revelation is working with, oh, here's your, if you remember this word next week, I'll buy you a candy bar. That's what I tell the confirmation kids. He's working with what we're going to call a realized eschatology. Eschatology. What does that word mean? Come on, one person. Meaning a word. 
Huh? The meaning of words? No. That is <laughs> etymology. Yeah. Close though. Well, it, it has what is the etymology of eschatology? <laughs> it has to do with end times and Christ. What's that? Eschatology has to do with end times. End times, the end. Every, and not just Christ, everyone has an eschatology. Everyone has a way the world's going to end. Communists know how the world's going to end, you know? Uh, how things end. How things come to an end. Eschatology, how to deal with the end times. And when we say realized eschatology, what we mean is, according to John's view, the end times are here. Already. When did the end times begin? When Christ came, died, rose, and ascended. That's the beginning of the end. Now, the end times are really long, and we kind of like to know the end end times. Uh, but John doesn't work that way. John's just saying, here's what you should expect until Christ returns. Okay? We are in the end times. How do we know? Because Jesus says at the end, I'm coming soon. And as, as Franzman in his little commentary here says, we're burdened with Jesus' line, I'm coming soon. It could be any moment. We're not waiting for the checklist to be filled out. It could happen at any moment. Okay? Well, soon is usually in one day, you know. <laughs> no. Or a week. Or a week. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, but for Jesus, it's however long he wants it to be. Remember, what is, what is that? <laughs> Can you say this? That terrible verse in Peter, the, to the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, you know, the That's devil must just be laughing his head off right now. Who? The world. The devil. <laughs> Because he's winning on the world. No, nope, that's not true. And we'll talk about that as we get into the book. He's not winning. He's losing. He's lost. He's done. Next, we'll talk about that. Um, John refers... responsible for all the bad. We'll talk about that. All right. Uh, John refers to his book as prophecy. He just says this is prophecy. They usually don't. Pretend like it's not, but it is. Um... He's got an optimistic worldview, which is funny to say. Uh, it's, it's pessimistic in the present, but optimistic about where it's going. It's going to be good, ultimately. Christ is going to make all things right. Though right now, it doesn't look like it. Uh, the angels don't interpret a lot. And finally, we're not waiting for the Messiah's first coming to make atonement. Jewish apocalyptic literature is always waiting for a Messiah. John realized eschatology thing again. John's saying, it's already come. So he will constantly use phrases about the blood of the Lamb, written to the churches who were purchased with the blood. That kind of stuff. Okay. Good. Questions at this point? We're going to do a lot of heady stuff tonight. And we will for the rest of this class, I'm sure. But this is all beginning stuff. Okay. Um, ways to interpret this book. First, don't go at it alone. Let me recommend a few resources to you. Um, this little commentary here, I've started working my way through it. Uh, so far, so good. Martin Franzman, The Revelation to John. Can you hold stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Franzman, F R A N Z M A N N. It's not in print anymore, which means you can get it really cheap on Amazon. Uh, used. Franzman, I guess I can pass these things around too. Uh, you will recall um, a couple of months back, I brought a little book called Pray for Joy, and it was a bunch of little prayers in there. And one of Franzman's prayers was how to what to pray before you drink wine. You know, that's guy. So it's delightful. This is the kind of guy he is. But he just writes beautifully. Um, and so I, I recommend that one. He's got one on Romans, and I just finished his book on Matthew, which is just staggering. But that's it's a pretty useful thing. Um, I've not read this one, so I can't really recommend it, but Aaron Luther Pluger, uh, that's a good German name, he's a Lutheran guy uh, who gives an end times book. There's not a lot of Lutheran guys who actually deal with the end times. Uh, he does, and he's got charts, and it's a very useful little book every time I've looked into it. It's quick, succinct, straightforward. Uh, so Pluger, I'll pass this one around that one. This book I'm not interested in dealing with right now. Uh, in the church, in the Missouri Senate, we have something called uh, the Commission on Theology and Church Relations. And whenever there's something controversial that comes up, the Synod says in convention, hey, you guys, you theology guys, write something for pastors so they can deal with this without having to think for themselves. That's not, that's not fair. Um, that's not fair. They don't have to think for themselves. Yeah, that's a joke. Um, though, then again, it's, it is helpful. Um, they have two on the end times. This one called The End Times. 
and another one on the Left Behind series, uh, written by the guy who taught my millennialism class, Reed Lessing, which is really pretty good. <laughs> but let me show you, tell you how things work in our synod here. Uh, the Left Behind one came out, I think, it was while I was in seminary, which was 2000 and, when did I, 2006, something like this, 2005, 2006. Left Behind came out in like the early 90s. So, I mean, that's how quick we are with these things. Uh, <laughs> but if, if you ever want these, I think they're free on the Missouri Senate website. Otherwise, I can get my hands on some of them for you. They're pretty helpful little tools for how to read end times, revelation kind of stuff. All right. Um, there's another thing that the Concordia puts out called the People's Commentary. I've heard great things about their little book on Revelation, the People's Commentary. If this really strikes your fancy and you want to go nuts, there's this puppy. The book of uh, the, the Concordia Commentary by Louis Brighton. If you want to watch this guy teach, he's on iTunes teaching the book of Revelation. It's a really long class that they have on there, but he teaches it. Uh, it's, it's rated PG-13 because of the language he uses. <laughs> can imagine that. Uh, the seminary having to bleep out their professors. Um, Are you kidding? No, I'm not. Which makes it entertaining. Uh, and so, uh, but Brighton is, Brighton is, um, boy, he's got to be 98 years old, so what does he care? Right? I mean, the guy's just, he's been doing this his whole life. And, and so, uh, but this book is phenomenal. Everything I've read so far on this is just through the roof. If you really get into this and want to dig in, this is the commentary to work with. What are you, just about he's going to every sentence? Yep. Because that book looks pretty good. It is thick. It's, I've been wanting to read this for a long time, and this book is, this class is my excuse. Ready? I'll, I'll give you the final. I think we're looking at. This is page 666, ironically enough, but that's just the index. Um, 600 and, 665 pages, something like that. So, no, you don't sit down like on an evening and like you know page through. Uh, but it is helpful for going through the different sections. Okay. That's the. No, you got it. People's commentary, great. So, if you want something that's a little easier reading, I've read yeah. some of these commentaries, and they are very technical. And some. Who does this one? Do you know? Um, I don't. Wayne, 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 I don't know if that one But they're very easy reading. Yeah, very good. Those are good. This is the people's commentary. Oh, that that's, like the, that's the best. That's one I'd recommend. Franzman will be good too, but that one will be yeah. the best if you want to do it. And that's from Concordia? Yeah, all this is Concordia. Concordia. Um, it's a complete setup for the entire Bible. There's a lot of stuff we're going to talk about. There's a lot of views on it. Uh, three views of the millennium and beyond. This book's all right, not, not too bad. Um, I had another one on views of Revelation, but I can't find it. So if I lent it to you, let me know. Um, I want it back. Um, this book's okay. Uh, this book, um, by the Left Behind guys, this is bad. No, we're not, having, we're not having a forbidden reading. Let's read whatever you want. But if you read this book, I will be able to tell. And I will sniff it out, and I will say, and I'll throw a flag at you uh, for the interpretations that are in here. Uh, Left Behind is a fictional series, but there's a real theology behind it, and this is the book that kind of lays it out. Okay, so, um, yeah. So, are we living in the end times? Tim LaHaye, Jerry Jenkins. Um, there you go. But these are some resources that are helpful to use. We'll be using a lot of different resources. If you want resources, come see me. That's my favorite thing is to give out resources. So I, I will probably start keeping track, though. Dave, did I send you my Daniel commentary? Yes. Okay. I, didn't I give it back to you? I hope so. I hope not because I can't find it. Okay. Uh, I texted I you. I was very nervous. All right. Good. Commercial's over. Now, ways to interpret the book. When you read the Bible, this is just general reading stuff for the Bible. You start with the book itself. So you go in the book. So uh, you're going to come to Revelation and you're going to see John using strange language. The first thing you do is check the rest of the book to see the patterns and if this kind of language has come up before, and if so, what was it doing? So you can kind of get at what John is doing here, okay? Word repetition uh, is a very big Hebrew thing. Um, so if words are repeating themselves, if, if scenarios are repeating themselves, we're going to want to try and figure out why that is, okay? So you, you read John's books. Then, to get a better idea of what's going on, you read outside of that book by reading books by the same author, what books, what other books did John write? We said it already. 
John, John one. and one, two, and three, John, right? So you start reading those books and you start to see connections and it helps clarify. This actually is true. If, if it's true that John functions like part one and Revelation functions at part two, you're gonna start seeing connections and things start to be clarified. For example, uh, the, the woman who grows wings and flies away, who gives birth to a baby. Well, a baby is probably Christ, <coughs> which means the woman is probably who? Mary. Now, does Jesus have any interaction with Mary in the Gospel of John? Yeah, in fact, when he's dying on the cross, he says, woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. And we believe there, Christ is actually doing a work to establish his church. So who does the woman represent? Mary and the church. And when the dragon chases the woman off into the wilderness, we can assume here we're getting a picture of the devil attacking the church. See, that's kind of a way you start doing these things. Now, someone might say, I don't agree with that interpretation. That's fine. But you've got to come up with a reason. Right now, we're working within John's corpus of writings, and this actually makes some sense in light of what's happening. Okay? You following me here? Also then, by the way, in 2nd and 3rd John, uh, John refers to the church as the lady. keeps referring to her as the lady. So, I mean, patterns start to show up, you see. All right? Then, typically, beyond that, you go to books in the same testament. So... John, uh, Revelation is in the New Testament, so you would start examining other stuff in the New Testament. Beyond that, then, the Old Testament. However, now I'm not an expert enough to ever make these kind of decisions, but it seems to me with John's book of Revelation, you're going to want to switch these puppies around. John's works, then the Old Testament, then the rest of the New Testament. Why? Because no New Testament book draws more from the Old Testament than John does. John never says, like Matthew, thus it was written. He never says, like Paul, that's why Moses said. But he uses more imagery and more Old Testament language than any other book in the New Testament. So you're going to need to know your Old Testament to do this work. Okay? Finally, any, sorry. Okay. Finally, then you're going to want to know historical context, other types of literature of a similar vein, apocalyptic literature, all that kind of stuff uh, to be able to get at this. All right? In fact, Franzman in his little commentary here has a great way of understanding this. He says, when you read John, Luther's second critique is right. It is fair. It's hard to get at. Why are we going to study a book where we don't even know what it says? He says, but if you think of John as an insider writing to other insiders, what we need to do is walk through the doors to get inside to figure out what he's talking about. And Franzman says there's three doors. See, we're already using imagery, isn't that correct? Uh, three doors to walk through to understand what, Jesus, uh, what John is saying. The first door you need to walk through, the first thing you need to understand, is Christ and his gospel. All of this is always under the cross. So you need to understand Christ and the gospel. Why? Because John's letter is saturated with the cross. Christ is everywhere in this book. And that comes at the very beginning. In fact, you read some of that first section, which we'll do next week. Um, it almost reads like the Apostles' Creed, second article of the Apostles' Creed. Christ who did this, who did this, who did this, who did this. I mean, it's just exactly what Christ has done. So his life, ministry, death, and resurrection for us and for the salvation of the church is necessary and critical. That is the overarching thing running through the whole thing. Just like the whole Bible, but obviously also in this book. Second door you need to walk through is the Old Testament. Again, we just visited that, but um, John seems to have favorites. He likes the Psalms, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, and Daniel, but especially Daniel. Daniel's like the big key to get you in. You know, Daniel's really important, so that's kind of why you had to read that. You'll see connections between what John says and what Daniel says. In fact, some of the phrases he'll use is almost just ripping Daniel straight off. Um, all right. Finally, then, the third thing, the third door that's good for us to walk through is John and his world. So be familiar with John. Uh, but Franzman says this, and this is a great line. When the Holy Spirit takes and uses a man, he does not unman him. Think about that for a second. John wasn't sitting on Patmos one day, you know, I don't know, making popcorn, <laughs> hanging out, throwing rocks, and then all of a sudden, poof, God came to him, and he started writing. And then he went back to throwing rocks. Like, that's not what happened, right? John wrote the book. 
John, a real historical person in a real historical place with a real understanding of the world and a real understanding of his context, is writing. So when he's writing, he's going to write in ways that make sense to his context. Think of St. Paul. St. Paul, you get to know his personality a little bit by reading him, don't you? You stupid Galatians, who's bewitched you, right? He seems like a delightful guy to have over. Um, But you're getting Paul, but Christ using Paul to give his word. Same with John. You're getting John, so it's helpful to know how John writes, but he's also writing in a context, so you need to know his context. The imagery he uses. Here's a good example. There's a text in chapter 3. He's writing to the church in Laodicea. And he says to the church in Laodicea, Jesus says this, I'm ready to spit you guys out of my mouth because you're lukewarm. You disgust me. Be either hot or cold, but not lukewarm. Now you and I hear that, and if you say be cold, what do you think that means? What does it sound like he's saying? Either turn away completely or be completely committed, right? Completely on fire for Christ or just walk away. But don't sit in here and be lukewarm and all this. If you're living in Laodicea, that's not at all what you would hear. Laodicea was a place that was famous for having bitter, lukewarm water. It was nasty. And so they worked really hard to get water ducts to bring good water to them. And the water that was good, it could be either hot and would have healing aspects to it, or it would be really cold and you could actually drink it and it was refreshing. So Jesus is saying, be either, uh, be either healing or refreshing. Don't be weak like you are right now or I'm going to spit you out. Do you see that? So it, it's a nuanced thing, but it's helpful to know the context so you can get at that so you're not misinterpreting it. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, or Rome is often called the city of seven hills. So when seven hills come up, we'll know he's talking about Rome. All right. Um, another thing, be somewhat familiar with Jewish apocalyptic literature. We don't need to be too familiar with that. That's what we have commentaries for to explain that when it matters. Uh, but it will help a little bit. Um, all right. One other thing here then. When we're reading this, let's not get bogged down in the details, but go for major theological themes. There's going to be a strange story where there's two men prophesying, and then they're going to die, and then they're going to come back to life. Well, who are these two men? And I imagine for every interpreter, you, you know, if you have one interpreter in the room, you have two interpretations of who the two men are, and no one really knows. There's a lot of debate about it. But the point there is probably that the preaching of the word cannot be stopped. That's the main theological theme. But if we get too bogged down in the details, we're going to miss the overarching theme. So that's going to be a big thing. We'll have to talk details, but the main idea is what is the text teaching? What is this symbol representing to us? Even if we can't get down to the specifics, who are these two men, we can say the word of the God will endure, or something like that. Make sense? All right. Now I gave you a handout. I, many of you may or may not know I'm, I'm in a coaching program right now uh, and, and uh, one of the coaches I have has a very good teacher at his church in fact Dave when you taught how to read the Bible this guy Zach McIntosh wrote that five things you can do to read the Bible he put together this little blog that has seven tips for reading Revelation realistically Hold on to this thing. This is going to be good and very useful for us. Okay. Is this from Macintosh? Yeah, this is he wrote it. Okay, uh, and I think I think it's great. Um, and here's a few tips for us to keep in mind as we go through the book. First, if it didn't mean that in John's day, it doesn't mean that in our day. So Hal Lindsey, late great planet Earth, very popular in the 70s, says when John sees massive locusts buzzing around, what he really sees is helicopters. Tommy Hawk, Tommy something helicopters or um or whatever keith invents when he's working uh that's john is visioning keith making drones and all this kind of stuff right that's not right that's not what he sees you know what he sees locusts because that's what he said now the locust may represent something else but he's not having images of the future you have to have a certain understanding of the bible that says he's going to tell us the future to define that you see what i'm saying there okay Uh, So if it doesn't mean that in John's day, it doesn't mean it in our day. John's writing to his audience, his churches. Um, Let's see, next. He he was trying to explain here on uh, number one. Yeah, number one. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. That, uh... It didn't mean that 
in John say then it doesn't mean Right. The, this is the best line in the whole book. Some people actually think that the infamous Mark of the Beast 666 is a code contained on computer chips which will one day be implanted by our government and our foreheads in a conspiracy to make us all lobotomized Satanists. The best lobotomized Satanists would be the best band name I've ever heard. That is great. That, that we'll become lobotomized Satanists? Yeah, Missouri Senator? No, no, I... Well, <laughs> No, Zach is a Missouri Senate guy. He's he's making a parody of the overreaction. So some people do believe that the the mark of the beast is a chip you're going to get in your arm or something like this. People thought it was credit cards before. My favorite interpretation of that, if you ever read Dostoevsky's book, The Idiot, I think it's there's a GPS in your phone. There's a strange guy who says uh, he says, "Well, it's the trains that now have united all of Russia," and he's got this great elaborate theological argument where I was like, wow, he's actually got a point. But the point of Dostoevsky is kind of making there, I think is helpful, is hey, everyone just pours what they want into this and finds whatever interpretation they can. So if it does if John if, if you don't have barcodes written in your hands in John's day, you that's not what he's talking about. Okay? Second tip, know your Bible. That's kind of what we talked about. He's very biblically literate. Now we're more equipped for this than we realize because we've been going through crossways. Uh, we've been doing a lot of this talk. We'll be fine with that. The next one, maybe not so much, at least for me. Know your history. There's going to be a lot of talk about the reign of Ciro, uh, 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 Caesar Nero, Nero Caesar, and Dom- Domitian, who were persecuting the church in violent and horrifying ways. Um, but language that was used about Domitian, that he was the Lord above lords, Th- this kind of language. The language that you find written on transcripts about him, the angels are saying in the book of Revelation. Well, why? Because John's saying, hey, guess who's actually Lord? There's one guy who does deserve those titles. It's not Domitian. See? Um, if you feel like you've seen this before, you have. This is the most controversial, but the most important thing for our reading of the text. When you read a novel, it tends to do what? Beginning middle and end, right? You're sitting this way. So beginning, middle, and end, right? And that's how we read. That's the Western mindset. But in an Eastern mindset, near Eastern mindset, they don't talk linearly, linearly. They talk circularly. Um, They they, they talk, uh, what does he say here? Uh, Thematically, not chronologically. Um... There's another way of saying this that I, I'm sort of losing here. Um, yeah, it's circular. So, for example, how many times does God create Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis? Once. Once. Twice. The answer is once. But twice we see the story, right? <laughs> it's a trick question. Uh, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Now, Genesis 1 gives you one perspective. Genesis 2 then says, now here's more of a detailed account. See, What you see taking place in Revelation is you'll have seven seals that are opened. Then the world will end. And then seven trumpets will blow. And then the world will end. And then seven horses will ride, and then the world will end. You know, like, wait, how many times can the world actually end? Yeah. Once. But we're getting it, the story told to us again and again and again. It's kind of like you're sitting at a sports bar, and you have all these TVs of the same game, but you're watching different stations, and they're coming from different angles. It's like, or, or we're in LA, right? It's like watching a car chase. You watch it on one station, and then you change the station, and you got the other helicopter's angle, right? Exactly. And you all see how it comes to an end just from different perspectives. So John's going to revisit and retell stories over and over and over again. Does that make sense? Okay. It's very important throughout the history of this book, the interpretation of this book, the big debate is, is he writing linearly or is he writing uh, uh, repetitively, circularly? It's a hard word to say. Um, and right now the scholarship is going back towards, well, look, he's a Hebrew guy. Paul is a Hebrew guy trained by Gentiles. So when he's writing to Gentiles, he's going to make arguments, linear arguments, right? John is a Hebrew guy who's getting into vision like this and is going to write the way that's most natural to him. So it's going to be a Hebrew way of writing. So we, we need to become Hebrews in the way we read. See, That'll be easy. All right. Um, next. Don't balance your checkbook using John's math. 
Someone said this morning, I can't even use my own math. That's <laughs> good. Uh, numbers are highly symbolic. Revelation is a highly symbolic book. It's not to be read literalistically. Now, there's a difference between literally and literalistic. If I say literalistic, I mean I read a poem and that says God is a rock, and I start trying to figure out which one. See, God is not a rock. We're speaking in poetry here. In apocalyptic literature, we're using images to describe something else. And so our job is to figure out what does the image mean. This comes not just with images, but also with numbers. So, there's bees in here. Having our own little apocalypse here up in the light. Um, for example, the, the infamous uh, John 7, 144,000. If you have Jehovah's Witnesses uh, as friends, they'll tell you, look, only 144,000 people are getting into heaven. Yeah. That's a strange thing to read because in one section it says, and I saw 144,000 standing before the throne. And the very next section it says, and I saw innumerable masses standing before the throne. So which is it? Innumerable masses or 144,000? Well, the masses are waiting for a cancellation. That's right. <laughs> nice. I'm using that line. That's a good line. Uh, no, what's going on here is John is using symbolism. And, and this is actually, you can make this argument from the book. There's 12 tribes which represent Israel. There's 12 apostles which represent New the church, 12 times 12 times 1,000, which means in the Bible the number of completeness. All of God's people, Jew and Gentile, this is just Ephesians and Galatians, all of Jew and Gentile will be united and everybody will be who is saved by Christ will be in his presence forever. That's what the 144,000 means. So is 144,000 or is it innumerable? Yes, the 144,000 represents the innumerable number of people. But it's, it means completeness. Everybody who will be there, should be there, will be there. Which is a very hopeful thing if you're worried that your head's going to be chopped off the next day and you're not sure Christ's on your side anymore. John is saying, no, 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 no. Everyone's going to be there. And you. You're part of the 144. You're part of the innumerable one. You see, you see the point here. Okay. It has nothing to do with the, the uh, when that fifth seal's opened up, and it has the people that have been martyred by, for Christ. I have no idea. Because uh, <laughs> maybe he, he sees the people that have been. Martyred. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. This is great. That might, I think it's one of my favorite lines in the whole book. The, those who have been beheaded for the faith are standing before Christ, and they're crying out, "How long?" You know, even in heaven, the prayer of the psalmist, how long, O oh Lord, until you avenge us? How, much, how long do we have to wait? And Jesus gives them all white robes and tells them to wait. It's kind of like my kids here, play my phone for a little while, go sit in the corner. You know, I mean, that's kind of the idea. Uh, but, but no, there, oh I'm not, again, I'm not quite clear on all this stuff yet. But that is talking about the church, those, those saints who have died waiting for Christ to return, saying, how long until the resurrection? Mm -hmm. And then the 144,000 is, I think, that resurrection that those saints are waiting for, and nobody's left out who's in the church. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think that's the connection. Again, I don't have the book down enough in my head to yeah. say there's the connection, but I think that's what's going on. Okay. Is there right. significance of the fact that 144 is a multiple of 12? Well, yeah, didn't I just say yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Twelve tribes, yeah. twelve apostles. And the yeah. number twelve is completion. No, number twelve, I think, will represent the people of God, because God has, because Israel has twelve tribes, and Jesus had, chooses twelve apostles right. to establish His church, and the church is built on the apostles and the prophets. So it's it's a symbol for the church or the people of God. Yeah. yeah. Uh, seven will be seven and one thousand. Those will be numbers for completeness. Seven will be God's number. The first week, seven days. Um, thousand, just it's a completion number. I don't know how they get there. We'll figure that out. Uh, John's imagery is polyvalent, which is a word he says that I learned in seminary. I did not. I don't know what that means. So his example here is very interesting. He says, "Look, sometimes some of these some of these images will have more than one meaning, which makes it." Worse to study the book, yeah. Uh, so the dragon, there's a, there's a snake who's spitting out frogs. Now, let's think Old Testament here. Who might the snake represent? 
devil. The devil. Why? It's it's guardian serpent. serpent, right? And he's spitting out frogs. We hear about frogs in the Old Testament. Plagues. plagues, right? And so maybe God is using the devil to bring plagues. Or maybe this this devil is spitting out frogs, and in spite of himself, God's people are being saved. Something like this. Probably more to the point here is uh, frogs are considered impure in the Levitical code or something like this. And so when the snake is spitting out frogs, essentially what's happening here is false teaching is arising and the devil is attacking the church with false teaching. But the plagues also come to mind. And so there might be different things going on here, more than one thing. Or it just might be we're not totally sure. Or weren't the plagues based on the gods of Egypt? Sure, yeah. sure. And, and, and yeah. they're on the devil's team. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so... Uh, but, but the point here is we may just not be able to get exactly what's going on. And that's okay. That's all right. We'll be able to sort of, I don't know. Right say to the end, the devil's trying to displace right. God with other gods. And this, is, and this is the main point that we will draw, though we might not say specifically this is exactly what the frogs are. The frogs are this god, or something like that. No, no, no. no. We just can say... The devil's always bringing idols. Good. He's always work, still working as distraction. Correct. Like always. even though he's defeated. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. But regardless of whether it's the plague of the frogs, or it represents the uncleanness of the Levitical law, it's still undesirable from a sure. the sure. standpoint of Good. the church. But again, either way, the point is. So remember, main theological theme here: we don't like the devil. Specifics. Well, we can discuss it, but I mean, John's themes will come through pretty clearly. Okay, okay, good. Um, last thing he says: don't be afraid. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm trying to scare the snot out of you, but quite frankly, a lot of this stuff will be just fine. You, you'll you'll know it. You'll be ready for it. You are ready for it, um, and it'll be you know we'll work through it, and it's okay. It'll be great. That's one of the main points of the Bible: to equip yourself, you can recognize the evil. Correct. Yeah, and, and Revelation will help us with that. Okay. Um, couple of other things. I, I want to say, can you guys give me, I know it's late, can you give me like 10 more minutes? Sure. And I want to break down for you in 10 minutes uh, the different schools of end times understandings. I'm going to tell you where we come out and um, sort of what perspective we're going to be coming from, just to be completely honest with all this stuff. Um, if you were to come to our church on a given, any given Sunday, how do you think Lutherans believe the world will end? And we get it every Sunday. How is the world going to come to an end? Return. Huh? With the return. Of right. Where do we say that every single Sunday? Uh, Apostles' Creed. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And we will rise in the resurrection. Right? Within the Holy Christian Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, life everlasting. Christ will return. And that's where we Lutherans like to stop. We say, yeah, that's good. He's coming back. That's all we need. Yeah, yeah. So be ready now, right? <laughs> Behold, I come soon. Yeah, come soon, Lord Jesus. Let's be ready now. That's, that's the end times theology we work with. Trouble is, Revelation has a lot more words than just the Apostles' Creed. Uh, a lot more is said about the end times. And a lot of other churches spend a lot of time trying to figure out the best way to understand all of these things said about the second coming. And so, uh, there are a number of ways of going about this. Some groups will go to Revelation and they will read it very literalistically. They will read it linearly. This is your left behind crowd. We'll talk about their big names in a second. But they'll read it linearly. Here's the checklist of things that must happen. Here we see them happening already. So we can expect the rapture to be Harold Camping. Remember this guy from about a year ago? Harold Camping came out and said, here's where the end of the world is going to be. He would predicted it six or seven times. But he was wrong all of them, as it turned out. Uh, he you... says, I'm glad I was wrong. Because I'm not well, it doesn't yeah. say in the Bible that the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You're never going to know. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's right. But, but no, you know what the argument is? But there's signs that help us figure out when that thief might be showing up. And, and it's just like, no, you're, you're missing the whole point. So, uh, so they're going to take it literalistically. They're going to see numbers and take them very literally. Uh, the thousand years means 1,000 years period. You can't uninterpret that. Uh, it's just what it says, all right? Which is usually, I mean, God bless them, they're taking the Bible literally, which is, you know, we're fans of that, but the problem is you're not taking the, literate, the, the, the genre seriously. Okay. 
Uh, so symbolic versus literal. Uh, you take it too literally, you get yourself into trouble because then you have to figure out where the women with wings are, right? Because which parts do you take literal, which parts do you not? Um, chronological versus thematic, liter uh, and we talked about this one already. It's not written linearly, it's circularly. Um, the role of the church, let's just do this. Okay. Three major schools of thought when it comes to the end, but four major schools of thought, when it comes to the end. The first one is called, we'll call it, well, everyone calls it amillennialism. Amillennialism. If you are an atheist, what are you? What do you believe about God? It doesn't exist. There is no God, right? So a millennial would probably be someone who thinks, what about the millennium? <laughs> there is no millennium. Yeah. This is a bad, it's a bad word to use to describe amillennialists because they'll say, even in my handy dandy book here, it's a pretty good one, the case for amillennialism. Uh, the, the theologian there will say, look, we believe in the millennium. We believe revelation. There's going to be a thousand years. We just happen to think it's right now. And he'll talk in terms of it being, our word again, realized eschatology. Christ is ruling and reigning now. And people will say, how can you say Christ is ruling and reigning now? Well, because Paul says it all over the New Testament. That's why we say it's happening right now. Um, and so we're going to be, in our circles here in the Missouri Senate Lutheran Church, or at least Faith Lutheran Church, we're going to kind of lean towards this one with a, a few caveats. We're not going to be straight amillennialists because they have a whole way of reading the Bible. All right? Um, there's another group where these guys kind of get along. This is where we would kind of be a mix of these guys. They're called preter, preterists. What? Yep. And now, now, Keith, I can't give you the etymology of that one. Uh, I don't know what a pre, where the word comes from. Preterists. I'm not sure. Um, but preterists believe that Revelation and all the prophecies of the New Testament happened in the era of the New Testament. It's all done. Preterists. Now, what's wrong with that? He hasn't returned. Christ hasn't come back yet, right? right so, so, so no one really is this hardcore. There, they, but they might be something called, this is where it just gets fun, a partial, <laughs> partial preterist. And a partial preterist says something like, when John is prophesying about the seven hills, he's talking about Rome. And the things John is dealing with, this is your question earlier, he's actually dealing with his modern day issues. So that we need to know about Rome if we're going to understand Revelation. Okay? We are a mix of these things as, as Lutherans. We kind of go with, with a mixture of these things. Um, when Jesus is talking in Matthew 24 about... Uh, wars and rumors of wars and all these destructive things, we're going to say, yeah, he's actually talking about the fall of the temple. It's already happened. See, And a, and a amillennialist, I think, will tend to agree with that, but preterists will say, look, some of the stuff happened in Jesus' day already. We don't need to be looking for signs. There's other groups. There's the post-millennials, Uh, and these are folks who, you don't see a lot of them anymore, but you saw them a lot in the 20th, uh, 19th and 20th century. Jonathan Edwards. You know Jonathan Edwards? Greatest American theologian. Uh, Calvinist, established Yale. Brilliant guy. Uh, Edwards is one of these guys where he believed... Archie Sproul, if you ever listen to the radio, he, he's, he says, I, I go back and forth between these two, which is actually a very comforting thing to say. Mm, you know. uh, but post-millennialists will say this. At some point in history, the gospel is going to take over and the world will be a Christian world. And it will be that way for a golden age, we'll call it the millennium. And some of them will say a literal thousand years, I guess. I'm not entirely sure on that. But I think they generally say, John is speaking symbolically with the thousand years, but it represents an age in this world when the gospel dominates. At the end of that, Satan will have a little season, then Christ will return and, but there will be a Christian world. There's some people who run really far with this. They're a group called theonomists. And theonomists, uh, theo, God, onomy, law, they believe we should have Christian government. 
not really a Christian government, Christian government based on Old Testament laws. So they work for that. They work for making sure that the Ten Commandments are still in the schools uh, and probably on the White House desk alongside um, De- De- Deuteronomy, you know, these sorts of things. And they believe that the country should be run according to the Old Testament laws. Once that happens, then we can establish a power on earth that way and then uh, by force or not, I guess, I'm not sure, spread the gospel throughout the world. And this will establish a Christian world. Um, that golden age sounds impossible since we're all sick. Right, exactly. It, it does not take into consideration uh, the depth of sin in humanity. That's right. Um, and, and so, see, this is where, Sheldon, that's a really excellent insight because what you do there is you say, wait a minute. This stuff needs to be looked at in light of the other theology we're always doing. Because what we tend to do is say, okay, now we'll stop talking about those theological topics and now we'll talk about the end times. And that's not how it works. All of theology is connected. I, I don't want to use this illustration with you before. Sometimes we think of theology, and this is wrong, uh, like doctrines are like pearls on a string, right? And you have this pearl, which is the two natures of Christ, this pearl, which is the Trinity, this pearl, which is the end times, this pearl, which is original sin, these sorts of things. And if one of those pearls falls off, the necklace is less pretty, but okay, whatever. If one of them scuffed, it's not great, but fine. But that's not how theology works. It's more like a human body, right? And so if the heartbeat is like the person of Christ, the person work of Christ, then the brain is going to be something else. And if your arm is injured, if your eschatology, your end times arm is injured, the rest of the body is going to be affected by that in some way. If you have a bad heart, the rest of the body is going to be affected by that in some way. Now, can someone still be a Christian with a messed up arm? Of course. Of course. But if you start to dissect doctrine that way and don't take into uh, consideration original sin when talking about Christians taking over the world, you're missing the point. Plus, We'll learn that, well, I'm convinced that John would have been a libertarian. He's not a big fan of government. (laughs) He's not a fan of what's going on with the powers that be. And so to say the church is going to have that back, that's kind of strange to the text. So that was a political joke I shouldn't have made. But the idea here is simply um, that, yeah, you're right. It doesn't take into consideration those theological issues. And then neither does this one. The last one, and this is the one we, we deal with the most, is the left behind theology. This is, um, buckle up, ready? Premillennial, you could have guessed that one. Here it comes. Dispensationalists. There you are, there you are, there's your word. Dispensation. Allists. What is a dispensation? You guys. Period in time. Period in time. An era. All right. Um, or you give out a dispensation, I think, right? Like you Which is a, pay somebody a, something. Yeah. A voucher to get out of jail. <laughs> Go <for jail>. <laughs> <laughs> Something interesting. All right. Well, <laughs> premillennial dispensationalists. Now, now, here's the idea here. All right. There are some who are just straight premillennialists, and they think there's a time coming. Uh, when Christ is going to return and reestablish his reign on earth for a thousand years, at the end of that thousand years, the devil's going to fight him. He's going to win, then the resurrection or something like this. Okay. Premillennial dispensationalists, however, are a little more elaborate. I'm taking more than my time, but I have to do this. Okay. Late 19th century, this guy named John Nelson Darby, he's kicked out of his church in Scotland for teaching this stuff. He comes up with a scheme that understands history in terms of seven dispensations. And he says the world works like this, that throughout history, God has given, let me make sure I I say this right, um, God has given, um, there are seven eras by which God tests his people in respect to a certain specific revelation of his will. So the very first era or dispensation is the era of innocence. All right, And here you have Adam and Eve who are in the garden, and they're innocent. right? And God says, I'm giving you a tree. You must not eat from it. And if you do well, you stay in the land. If not, you're out. And what happens? Eat from the tree, they're out. Bring on the second dispensation. This is the dispensation of conscience, in which conscience guides the way you live. It's the Jiminy Cricket era, apparently. Uh, and here, uh, it's the conscience that condemns. 
do what's right in your mind. So what does God say to Cain? Sin is crouching at your door, waiting for you. Don't let it have its way. But Cain breaks it. By the way, has anyone ever read the book East of Eden? Mm-hmm. Holy cow, you've got to read that book. It's fantastic mm-hmm. book. I just finished it off. No, I heard the movie is nothing like the book. <laughs> Book's fantastic. Okay. Um, it's, it's on that theme of Cain and Abel. Then humanity clearly fails with that. So the next we have one, it's uh, human government. I think this goes from, oh boy, I don't remember. The, conscience is from Adam to Noah, Noah to Abraham is human government. From Abraham to Moses is the era of promise. Uh, then from Moses to Jesus is the era of law. Thank you. Law. And what they say is this. God shows Israel to be his people, and he promised them a land, and he's going to keep that promise to them. But here's what happens. God sends his son Jesus into the world to what? Establish his reign on earth. And was he accepted by the Jewish nation? No. What'd they do to him? And so did the Romans. This is beside the point. They crucified him. Put him up on a cross. And so Jesus said, fine. Then I'm going to take my services to the Gentiles. And he establishes the Gentile church with a few Jews scattered here and there, but it's the Gentile church. And this is what we would call a parenthesis in history. It's almost accidental. Now, not all dispensationalists will talk this way, but I think this was Darby's way of doing it. Uh, there, this is a, a parent, parenthesis but until Christ wants to reestablish his work with Israel and fit, fulfill his promises that he made to them. Okay? And so what's happening now, we'll go on to a certain point. Then Christ will say, it's time to start working with Israel again. And he will suck up out of the world his church. He will rapture them. It's the idea of the rapture. He will bring them out of the world. And after that, no one knows exactly when after that, but after that there will come seven years of tribulation. Terrible tribulation. For all those who didn't believe in Christ, they will suffer the wrath of God for seven years. Some will convert, some will not. It will be an awful thing. At the end of that seven-year tribulation, when the Antichrist is there and all these things are going on, Christ will then return and beat the bad guys, the Antichrist, and establish his thousand-year reign on earth. And he will reign as the new Davidic king in Israel for a thousand years, and it will be a thousand years of peace. At the end of that thousand years, the devil will come, have his little heyday. And by the way, that little devil's heyday thing, every of these, every one of these interpretations thinks that's going to happen. We all think that will happen. It will get worse before it gets better. But the very end is going to be really bad. Okay? So the devil comes back, has his heyday. Jesus ultimately defeats him. Then you have what you call the great white throne judgment, where uh, the bad guys go to hell, the good guys go to heaven. Uh, I, I think, now this I'm not entirely sure of, the Jews inherit the earth and the church inherits heaven which is a Gnostic thing to say, quite frankly. That's not a biblical way of speaking. We all rise from the dead on the last day. Um, but this is, this is the image they have. That's the premillennial dispensationalist story. They're saying right now there is a distinction between Jews and Gentiles, Israel and the church. The church is not Israel expanded, or the church, Israel is not Jesus reduced to one. And let me backtrack that. Too much of a loaded phrase there. The, the way we see it is this. Israel failed. Christ came. Did everything Israel was supposed to do, only faithfully. Read Matthew's Gospel. Exactly what's going on there. Uh, he dies for the sins of Israel and the world, rises again on the third day and says, everyone is right with God through the blood of Christ, Jew or Gentile. There's no distinction. That's Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians says there's no distinction. Dispensationalist says... But there is. Because God hasn't fulfilled all of his promises to Israel. They're not in the land. When Schofield's writing, Schofield, um, well, Schofield, but, but Darby, when Darby's writing, was Israel in the land late 19th century? No. And Darby says, look, if Israel ever goes back to the land, that is the super sign that Christ is about to return. Well, lo and behold, guess what happened in 1948? Oh, the dispensationalists won and said, look, this is the super sign. Now what we need to do is rebuild the temple. And why do they need to rebuild the temple? Because once the temple is rebuilt in their scheme, then Christ has some place to return to. And he'll return to that temple. Now, you watch TBN, Channel 40. Don't watch TBN, Channel 40. You watch that station. Uh, and right now, instead of helping starving kids, what you can do is send money in 
and you can buy a ticket for a Jew to go back to Israel and live there. Um, so why? Well, you get all the Jews back to Israel because then Christ will return. Now, they don't mention the fact that in their story, once the Jews all get back there and the church is raptured out, they're going to suffer the worst Holocaust in the history of the world. That part never seems to come up in the TBN advertisements. <laughs> so who, and so they'll say, oh, look, you, you all millennials are anti-Semitic. Yeah, we're not the ones sending back the Jews to die. Um, whatever you want to do with that. Uh, but the idea here is that there's a, a plan for Israel and a plan for the church, which we say, no, that was obliterated in Christ. You want to go back to the law. You want to go back to the shadows. We want to live in the reality, which is Jesus. That's Hebrews. I mean, see, this gets back to Shelton's thing here. The rest of the New Testament speaks against this idea, but what they do is they say, all right, we need to understand the rest of the Bible in light of this very literal reading of Revelation. So you start with Revelation and then work back. That's the wrong way to do it. You start with the clear stuff and then come to Revelation because it's bats. And there's all crazy stuff going on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, anything else you want to bring up about these guys? Uh, that's pretty good, I think. Um, but I mean, this, I mean, this has a huge impact actually on history. Zionism has an impact on the establishment of Israel, though it's not all just a theological plan. I mean, there's a lot more to it than that. But uh, very interesting stuff. And this is where you get the idea, you know, uh, Gog and Magog, which you should have read about in Ezekiel, that's really talking about Russia. No, it's probably actually talking about Gog and Magog. I mean, that's... <laughs> um, and they're trying to find modern-day things happening in those texts. Seems That's a bad way of reading. Genesis. What you want to not do is sit down with your newspaper in one hand and Revelation in the other and say, look at that. Oh, sure enough. It's right there. It's not a, it's not a faithful reading of the passage. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, next week, we will talk about the major themes of Revelation, and then we will talk about um, who wrote it, context stuff, but then we'll get into it. Uh, I expect us to be probably through the first couple of verses. We're not going to get through the whole chapter, but at least with the introductory stuff um, next week. Okay? Sound good? Yep. Yes, Sheldon. Do we have a guideline or do we just No. Read? Uh, here's what I recommend. Uh, with Crossway stuff, if you've, if you've got the book, hold on to it. If not, I would recommend for next week. There's no homework or nothing either. There. No, no, no. I, I would recommend you read like the first... Now you read the first couple pages. Yeah. The best thing in here is going to be page 136 and 137 where it outlines the book. I mean, that's really a useful thing. It really, really is. Though it's not copied well, I should have used color on that one, sorry. Um, that's a really useful thing. And then we'll get to the, int and maybe the introduction, but we'll get to the seven churches in a few weeks, okay? The outline that's in that people's commentary is actually quite good. Yeah. I don't know if I have this in Way in the front. Oh, there's pictures in it. Oh, <laughs> that's the ticket. <laughs> Oh, I want to get this one. <laughs> All right. All right, let's close with prayer, and you guys can go. Father, thank you. Uh, I thank you for the patience of this class and them bearing with me tonight, Lord. But I do thank you um, for giving us a book that challenges us, that forces us to examine issues and think through how we read the Bible. And so we pray tonight, Lord, that you would give us wisdom as we study this book. May this be a marvelous class, Lord. May your will be done among us uh, and guide us through this discussion. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Guide us home. Give us safe trips. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, you guys. Thanks for listening to this Bible study presentation from Faith Lutheran Church in Moorpark, California. We hope this has helped you grow in your Christian faith and study of the Bible. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.